Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of September 15th, 2014. This is Amal Matu at University of Maryland, and this is a very special week, actually, as we start the beginning of our fourth year. Unbelievable that we've been at this for four years now. That's 156, approximately, consecutive episodes and we are still nowhere close to running out of things to talk about with electrocardiography. And over the past three years, I know I've learned an awful lot from the cases that you all have sent me. I've had to look up a lot of stuff in trying to figure out some of the answers. And I hope you all have been learning from what we've been talking about and learning from each other as well. So keep those cases coming. It's been, I think, a great benefit to everybody, most definitely to me as well. Well, we're going to keep it short and sweet this week so that we can get on to eating our cake, right? And this is a, a nice quick case that was sent probably over a year ago by Dr. Jim Villarreal, who works in Salt Lake City, Utah. And he nailed the diagnosis, even though the EKG machine completely got it wrong here. He was taking care of a 67-year-old woman who presented to the emergency department with a two-week history of dyspnea on exertion. She's got no chest pain or cough, and her exam was really just notable for a mild tachypnea. She wasn't in respiratory distress, but she was breathing pretty quickly, and there was nothing jumping out at him on the 12 lead EKG, uh, or rather on the physical exam. But on getting the 12 lead EKG, there was something that did jump out at him. The EKG machine, of course, looked at this, and the EKG machine called this uh, inferior, let me get rid of this for a second, inferior ischemia and also anterior wall ischemia. There's flip T waves all over the place. And one of the things we've said before is that when you see flip T waves, you should not always just automatically assume that T wave inversions equal cardiac ischemia. That's what I learned. That's what a lot of people learn. It's wrong. T wave inversions are common in a lot of conditions. And maybe one week we'll we'll come up with a, a list of probably 50 things that can flip your T waves. But in addition to cardiac ischemia, the other major organ system that is notorious for flipping the T's is the pulmonary system, the lungs. Lung problems can cause flip T waves. Acute lung problems, for example, pulmonary embolism or pneumonia or even hyperventilation. Hey, if you want to have a little fun during one of your shifts, hook yourself up to a 12 lead EKG and then just start hyperventilating and you will notice your T waves uh, in many people, your T waves will flip you may then pass out. So maybe it's not such a good idea. And if you do that, don't tell anyone that I told you to do it. Probably, uh, you know what, just delete the last uh, 30 seconds or so. Not a good idea. Uh, but maybe you can suggest it to one of your colleagues. But definitely don't do it if you're single coverage. Gosh, that would be bad news. Anyway, uh, hyperventilation can do it. And chronic problems like COPD and pulmonary hypertension can do it. Well, one of the things that we've talked about is that if you ever notice this combination of T wave inversions in the inferior and the anterior leads together. Sure, if you have lateral, that adds a little bit more, but really if it's just inferior and anterior that's all you need. That is highly specific for pulmonary hypertension. That's something that Marriott, one of the real experts in the history of electrocardiography, he talked about this three decades ago at least, when you see flip T waves in the inferior and anteroseptal leads, that is pulmonary hypertension. And in the emergency department, if those T wave inversions are new, if your patient's symptomatic, new acute, or rather new pulmonary hypertension, in other words, acute pulmonary hypertension in the emergency department is what? Of course, <clears throat> it is a large pulmonary embolism. This is a sign of heart strain. There's various theories about why PE can flip your T waves. Some people say that pulmonary embolism induces some subendocardial hypoxia and ischemia. Some people say that when you get some ventricular distension, it shifts the axis of the heart and that can produce some T wave inversions. Whatever the reasons are, it's very important to remember that when you have new T wave inversions, for the third time now, when you have new T wave inversions in the inferior and anteroseptal leads, that is acute pulmonary hypertension, which in emergency medicine is PE. If those are old flip T waves, then it means a person probably has some element of chronic or old pulmonary hypertension. 
And in our, uh, what we've studied this actually and published this in cases that we've looked at when people have new flip T waves in the inferior and anterior septal leads, the diagnosis number one, two, and three turns out to be pulmonary embolism and not acute ischemia. And Marriott specifically said in his textbooks, whenever you think you're looking at acute inferior anterior septal ischemia, a light bulb should go off in your head. Inferior plus anterior septal ischemia equals pulmonary embolism, all right? So very simple case. And uh, Jim got the diagnosis long before even needing a CAT scan. He looked at that 12 at EKG and called it a PE right from the start. And then he went ahead and got his confirmatory uh, CT and it turned out to be a saddle embolus. Fortunately, the patient ended up doing okay. Usually these are relatively large PEs, not the small PEs that you're getting listening to this uh, video cast or that I'm getting providing the video cast. Not the small PEs that we probably all walk around with. These are generally large PEs. So simple take home points. Remember once again, large PEs are notorious for causing flip T waves, especially in the inferior and anteroseptal leads. Anteroseptal is probably most common, but when you have anteroseptal plus inferior, it turns out that that's very, very predictive that somebody has a PE and what we in our department have learned is that that's a PE until proven otherwise, and a lot of other people have come to realize that as well. Well, I'm not going to belabor this point. We've talked about this T-wave inversion thing with PE a few other times before, and if you want to get some more cases, just go to our website, www.ekg.umem.org. There, there it is right there. Go to this website, and you'll come up with all of the different cases. Then just scroll down the left-hand side of this website, and then... Uh, you'll come to a search feature, and then you can just enter whatever you want. Put uh, pulmonary embolism in there, and you'll come up with a handful of previous cases of PE. These are a couple of relatively recent cases that we've we've done on PE. Uh, April 15th, 2013, June 24th, 2012, if you want a few more cases. But be on the lookout for this. You're going to see it in your practice. If you take care of patients that have PE, you have been seeing this already. You will continue to see it as well. So simple, quick take-home points there. And my thanks to Jim Villarreal for sending this uh, classic example of a PE. I hope that was helpful. And again, thanks so much for supporting this video cast for three years. And I look forward to another great year of electrocardiography fun uh, in store for us. All right. So until next week, take care.